So, Sharon, uh, where to start? I guess, welcome Sharon, how are you? That's a good place to start. Really good, just to, to date stamp it, it's the Tuesday after the bank holiday weekend, so that's why I look like a lobster, because I think <laughs> the world forgot what sunscreen was yesterday, and everybody went out into the glorious sunshine, and there's a lighter shade of pink, so that's why I'm looking a little bit glowing today. That's why we're releasing this podcast as a video as well, so that you can uh, you can really feel yeah. that effect. Okay, now, uh, as I said before, um, Sharon has a, a large online presence and, and has released a great deal of guidance for new teachers. So today we don't want to be going over that, that same guidance because it's already out there and you can go and, and listen and watch to it and, and, and take it all in. And, and th those links will be uh, in the show notes below. But what we would like to start with today, Sharon, is a question that we ask many of our guests when they come on, which is, what is your why as an educator? Uh, I don't just have one why. I have a variety of different whys, but my first why I do what I do starts on an intrinsically personal and selfish level. I came out of the classroom in 2012, burnt out, and I came out looking for tutoring in many ways as my lifeboat from where I was in the classroom to where I am now. And one of the casualties that needed to come into the lifeboat with me were my children. So I do what I do, first and foremost, to provide a lifestyle for my own kids, Jamie and Ellie. And I don't just mean a financial lifestyle and I don't just mean a work-life balance, but I do what I do to model for my children what a healthy working life looks like. Because they've seen me behind piles of books, they've seen me crying, they've seen me stressed and worrying about absolute nonsense and toxic work environments that I shouldn't have even been considering when I should have been raising them. So my first why is my children. My second why I do what I do in particular now at the helm of Connexus is because I am incredibly supportive of incredibly talented individuals within a classroom who feel trapped, who see that tutoring is a way out of the classroom. It is that lifeboat route, but what I'm doing at the moment is accelerating a tutor from a sole trader purpose and moving them into a business owner that allows them to strategically run a business of tutoring that takes themselves operationally out of what they're doing and as a result provides a better lifestyle for themselves. So there are my two main whys, the children and to empower tutors and teachers to running a business for themselves that really is going to make a significant difference to the way they live. Uh, and that's something that you've done very successfully already. Um, and what you've also done very successfully is tie in my second question. Um, so well done uh, for that, Sharon. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very clever of you. But my second question was going to be about kind of the, the, the philosophy behind Connexus, but already you, you, you've kind of gone into it um, a little bit there. And it, it's been amazing to see that kind of Connexus grow in, into what it is today. Now, we'll be getting on to a little bit more about the other kind of aspects of, of what you do currently and how you've got to, to, to those positions. But I guess a good place to start really would be looking at what you've taken from your days as a teacher and, and, and the work that you still do in teaching into your tutoring. So what, what kind of skills have you taken that, that other educators could, could take as it's, well? It's not what skills I've taken that I think has, has made it successful. It's what I've left behind, okay? What I have left behind from the way I was as a teacher and what I've brought into tutoring is what's made the difference in my business. So when I was a teacher, I spent 90% of my time proving what I did for the other 10%. So let's just roll back on what I mean by that. I would deliver an hour's lesson that I would have to plan, show evidence of planning, show evidence that the objectives were met. Then I would have to assess it. Then I would have to mark the children's book. I would then have to give evidence of verbal feedback, written feedback. I would then have to write a report and then I would have to do a parents evening. And 90% of what I actually did was proving the 10% of what I delivered. And I've left that 90% behind. So what a really good tutor does when transitioning from a teacher to a tutor is let go of that need to prove what you are doing. And what you take from the classroom is that magic 
that you're only allowed to do for 10% of the time, which is in the main, impart that content knowledge that these kids need. And secondly, inspire with the, them with the confidence that they can do it. And that's the bit we do intrinsically like breathing. And it's actually the, the last on a long list on a to-do list. What have I got to do? I've got to mark, I've got to assess, I've got to fill in that data capture. That's the stuff you leave behind as a tutor. And the more you can ditch that and the sooner you can ditch that and focus on a fluid delivery on a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-three, a one-to-six as a tutor, you will create a magic source that gets children coming back to you time and time again. So when I look at what made, it, made a significant difference for me was in, I'm a GCSE English, that, that, that was me. So in 2015, we suddenly found ourselves as key stage four teachers and tutors with a raft of content. Michael Gove just suddenly went, irrespective of your reading age, your socioeconomic background, we are going to provide GCSEs, quite frankly, that are suitable for grammar school kids. OK, from very affluent and middle class areas. We are going to structure a GCSE English curriculum that delivers language and literature in four hours a week. Your literature has got five texts, like you've got a reading age of 12. And you're having to do Dickens, Shakespeare, comparing poems from other cultures, a, 20, a 20th century play and unseen poetry. Oh, and then as testing you for English language, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you two extracts, one from the 19th century, one from the 21st century. And we're going to ask you a series of questions about writers' attitudes and methods. It almost made it impossible to deliver within the time scale for a teacher. So... What a really brilliant tutor does is strips back everything that's going on in the classroom, sits down, and this is my style. You need 40 marks on the writing section. Right, kid, this is the plan. And it removes all of the content delivery that needs to be done within the classroom and focuses completely on that exam. So I left a lot behind when I transitioned from teaching to tutoring. And I kept the bits that mattered, which was the engagement with the kids, which was the confidence building, but delivering the content and the knowledge that I believed they needed. They didn't need to go away with me and, and, and do a big like worksheet and they don't need to have a 20 minute discussion about this and, and do some joint annotation. They needed somebody sat in front of them telling them what they needed to be doing. So to summarize, it's not what I've taken, it's what I ditched that makes the difference. Okay, so sometimes in order to move forward, we need to think about what we can strip away and what we can streamline to take into a kind of our new role, our new profession, our new yeah. opportunity, whatever it is, yeah. Okay, well, I think that that's, that's a very powerful message, isn't it? Is, is, is thinking about what you can leave behind um, to move into your tutoring role, whichever you know profession you've come and from. That's, and that's one of the hard points for a tutor because they are permission led as a teacher. They're driven by bells and timetables. They are not allowed to come up with new ideas and innovation because in order to, nobody in today's society in teaching actually goes and knocks on that deputy head teacher's door and says, can I have two minutes of your time, please? I've got a really great idea, just doesn't happen. The time constraints, the pressures, the environments, that, that's not what takes place. But I think this is one of the problems that, that tutors emerging from teachers face. I don't know of any other profession where it goes hand in hand that you take work home as a given, okay? So I've got a team of six full-time members of staff at my head office. I wouldn't dream of sending them an email out of hours. I'll send them an email, but I'll schedule it for eight o'clock, nine o'clock the following morning, because I do not expect my teams to be working for unpaid hours. However, your average teacher can be doing 90 hours a week at home, at weekends, in holidays. So if you're not careful when you move from the classroom to becoming a tutor, there is a guilt attached if you don't think you're doing all those additional hours. OK, so a teacher, by definition, thinks I'm not working on a Sunday. Something must be wrong or I've not spent two hours planning a one hour session. And very carefully, 
What tutors do is they provide themselves with another job. And they find that they get booked up really quickly. They're having to turn clients away because their time is their only commodity that they have to offer. And let's face it, there's only so many hours you can get the kids that you want. So they tend to be straight after school, no later than eight o'clock in the evening, your weekends, and then you might do some day work as intervention in the school. So as a tutor, if you're not careful, you bottleneck yourself again. That actually your success is, 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 is becoming part of your failure because you've more kids than you can accommodate or there's not enough hours in the day to meet the needs. And then here's the crippler. Once they've sat their GCSEs or done the SATs, they disappear off into the ether and you have the longest summer holiday of your life. So it's not the easiest of routes to go into. Obviously, I've circumnavigated all of those with my business model, but the role of the tutor isn't as easy as it, as it looks in many respects because teachers have that natural desire to overwork and overthink. It is a very much a seasonal thing. Um, and it, it's a completely different mindset that's needed to succeed as a tutor. And that's how communities such as yours and such as ours are, are helping those new to tutoring or those who need more confidence in what they do to, mm -hmm. to see that there is value. Uh, or, or really just to end the day with a smile and, and a sense of support because uh, it can be a very unforgiving and, unf and kind of you know, unrewarding job at, at many times. Um, mm. Now that's not to say that it is the whole time uh, and we could talk as well for another hour about you know all of the aspects that make tutoring such a rewarding job and part of that is perhaps linked into what I'm about to ask which is let's flip the switch let's look at this from another way around why should someone who's leaving the teaching profession go into tutoring why should they because it's 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 what I've just said it's it's turning the 10% that you're actually able to do that you love into the 100% of what you can deliver. Now, tutoring isn't always an option for many of our teachers because there is a demand. Primary, you're all right. Primary, you're fine. You can offer across the board. You can still skill yourself up. That's no problem at all. But if you're a secondary school teacher and you're teaching DT or you're a secondary school teacher and you're teaching art, the chances are that tutoring in its one-to-one -one basis isn't going to be your route. So not all teachers have that as an opportunity available to them. OK, but why I think a teacher should go into tutoring. When a teacher's thinking of leaving, one of two things happens, Ludo. The thought of even anything to do with education triggers them seeing a handout, looking at the Times Educational Supplement, and they go into a cult. Don't go into tutoring. Change your career completely. But why a teacher should go into tutoring is because they keep the hand in with a massive skill set that should not be thrown away just because you leave in the classroom. You've got years of experience. And one of the biggest problems that I face with tutors is they undervalue themselves and they go, well, I might just try a bit of tutoring and I might, I might just become a tutor for a bit. The demand. The way in which tutors are now being held in higher esteem than they ever have been, it really almost seems to be an elevated choice rather than what you do as a plan B. Absolutely not. It should be, it should be approached and embraced. Being a tutor now, I think, is raising you in gravitas even more than a teacher, to be perfectly honest, if we do our PR right, because... And I know we're going to talk about this in a bit. The National Tutoring Programme has done that. It has suddenly put tuition into the political forecourt for discussion. Tutors and tutoring before the NTP as this weird, weird unspoken world that was going on. Um, kids didn't feel they could tell the teachers that they had a tutor in case it offended them. Schools wouldn't necessarily support tutors and advocate them because they felt that they weren't doing their job properly. So there was this like chasm between what should have been a really great synergy opportunity, teachers delivering the content and tutors, the icing on the cake, doing um, the exam focused delivery. No tutor is ever, ever going to replace that cake. There's no two ways about it. You've got really great quality teaching and learning going on for five hours a week on one particular subject, your tutor is just polishing. 
But what the National Tutoring Programme has now done, all of a sudden, it's changed the way we see tutoring. At its worst, it was, it was the choice of the elite. It was only what people with money could pay for. And it was, it was something that was seen as quite divisive. You know, that kid can afford a tutor and that kid can't. We are now going in as a profession into schools, offering tuition to the most disadvantaged young people that we have. So now at reception, it's perfectly okay. Hiya, the tutor's here for such and such a group. The English teacher's now saying, Danny, you need to go to your tutor. That wasn't happening two years ago. That, that was absolutely not the case. And I think we've got a massive legacy here with the NTP where tuition is concerned because it's taken it from something that's used in speech marks to tutor and actually has said, this is a synergy profession that could be really, really crucial in getting these kids back up to where they need to be because it's a totally different skill set. Taking children out of a class on a one to three, online tutoring with them whilst they're sat in that classroom, it's massive. It's absolutely great, which is why I think as an industry, we need to get behind the NTP and really support what's going on because the legacy for this is massive. And I don't just mean the legacy in terms of workload, but I mean in terms of how we are viewed as an organisation. We have gone from the poor relations. We've gone from those who are an afterthought or it's something that they've gone on to do once they've left teaching. This is a career option and a career choice that is incredibly lucrative, is incredibly powerful for young people. And I think it's something that we need to be more of a band of brothers together and actually become a force to be reckoned with as individuals within the UK at the moment. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into that because let's use the medium of a podcast to, to go into what we mean a little bit more than we ever could in a blog or an article or, or, or an email. What is the future of, of tutors working in schools? I, I, think, I think the longevity of this and the legacy I really, I do think we've seen a shift. I think we've seen an irreversible shift. Tutors coming into schools, tutors. The one problem we have at this moment in time, but it's manageable with an online presence. You'll speak to the head of, um, of a, a primary school. She'll say, Sharon, I've got 30 groups. I've got 30 groups of kids that I just want it going on a one to three, brilliant really forward thinking head teacher understands the importance of why tutoring is so important but can't house them hasn't got 30 rooms for these to be going on you know or we've got one tutor doing 30 hours but what we have got is we've got head teachers who are suddenly factoring in to their planning and to the management of their intervention the word tutor now, when we've gone in in the past and worked within schools, we've gone in under the intervention banner. And I know it's linguistics and I know it's language at the end of the day, but who's doing the maths intervention? Who's in charge of the English intervention? Well, intervention is actually being phased out as an expression and tutoring is now coming into the fore. And that's why I think we've got a legacy because the word tutoring is going to be banded around senior leadership team meetings it's going to be factored into planning it's going to be factored into budgeting and that's why i think we've got some real opportunities here to bridge that gap between what was two originally polarized services yeah okay so if you are able to could you give us a little bit more insight into what a tutor who has never worked in a school before, but who now, because of these opportunities you're just talking about, and because of the legacy of the NTP, and might be opening up in front of this tutor in terms of potential future opportunities, what does a tutor who's about to go and work in a school as a tutor need to know? What, what are some of the you things? Have they a need mindset. To know? It's not what they need to know, it's how they need to think and how they need to feel. So the first thing they do is they don't go in with a begging bowl thinking, I can't believe this opportunity is opened up to me. The first thing a tutor needs to do is sort out their own mindset and say, I am a qualified professional who on a service level agreement is being deployed to go into a school and deliver a service. And are therefore, what does, 
what do I need to know? I need to, what classroom I'm going to have, what, li what liaison I'm going to have with the head teacher, the classroom teacher, what do you want me to deliver? Actually, if I was going in to a school, I wouldn't need some woman on a podcast to give me advice as to what I needed to know, because I would know what I needed to know in order to make that successful. And we go in now with an attitude of, you, you need to meet some of my needs in order to make this successful. You're paying for me. The government's paying for me. So do you know what? I'm not going picking the kids up because you pay me by the hour. So if you want me to traipse around the school and go and pick the kids up and then traipse them back again, you might only be getting 35 minutes tuition. I need the direct email address with that classroom teacher so I can liaise with them. What I would also like is I'd like the right environment. So it's not what do I need to know, it's what do I want? And I know it takes some, some guts to have that as a kind of mindset, but the minute you do, the minute you are transparent with your expectations, schools shift. I did it with parents years ago. I used to get talking at the door, or she'd be 10 minutes getting the kids down the stairs. Come on, she's here, she's here. And then all of a sudden I went, you know, you pay me by the hour. So the minute I knock on the door, I, you know, the clock's ticking. It's fine if you want to chat to me about your husband and the fact is, you know, he's doing your editing at the moment. Crack on, but I'm going after an hour. That kid was brought down. That kid was ready. I was out the door. And that's what I think tutors need to do when they're going into schools. They need to get that backbone that says, I am a professional person coming into an educational environment and I will be treated with the amount of respect that I command on entry. So go suited and booted, go with your own lanyard, go with your books under your arms, knock on the reception. Hi, it's Sharon Corley. I'm here to see the head of English. I am the English tutor. And it's an attitude that I think tutors need to develop more than anything, which is that kind of, not do you know who I am, but do you know what I can do? I love that phrase. I'd like to think you'd spent hours preparing that phrase, building up to that moment, Sharon, but I know that came in the, just in the yeah, moment. Top of my head. Because it comes from within. That's because yeah. it's something that you Because I know my own value. Yeah. hundred percent know my own value and know what I can offer. And, and this is this is part of the this is part of the problem with our profession. And I I run a Facebook group, Ludo, right? And my Facebook group that I run jointly with Sarah Dunwood is called Life After Teaching, Exit the Classroom and Thrive. And we started a Facebook group in June of 2020 during lockdown. And we talked about it for years. And I had spent most, if not all of the last 10 years of my life, rescuing, tutor, uh, rescuing teachers from the classroom. And I'm talking talented individuals with a vocation, with the ability to make such a terrific difference to young people's lives. And they were broken. They were either overworked, they were bullied, they were at the wit's end, they didn't know what to do. And in 2012, I sat in the kitchen of one of the most talented maths teachers I've ever worked with. He was an advanced skills teacher in Salford. He'd been head of maths, head of year. And he sat there with his head in his hands and he went, do you know what, Sharon? He said, I I'm thinking, so he, out on stress, resigned. He said, do you know what I'm thinking? He said, I've fitted this kitchen. He said, and I think I'd, if I put an advert in the post office, he said, I think I could be a cracking kitchen fitter. I said, are you for real? You are a maths teacher. What's going on here that your self-esteem is so low? You are ready to just hurl a wealth of experience and knowledge out of the window. But that is the way in which the profession is getting many, many of our incredibly talented staff because they are under so much pressure to provide the evidence because the senior leadership teams are under so much pressure. Do you know when we were in lockdown, within weeks of going online, there were learning walks online how do you drop into somebody's Zoom call to check what they are delivering? And, and this need within schools to constantly prove stuff. People are buckling under the pressure. So we started in June 2020. And it's now May. Oh, no, it's, it's June. No, Sharon. 2021. <laughs> We're literally coming up to the 12 month anniversary. And we've got 22,000 members. 22,000 teachers who are either looking to exit the classroom 
or already have. And that's got to signal something. That's got to be delivering a message out there. Our education is in crisis. There has been a demand from tutoring since I can remember. I had a tutor in 1988. There is, this isn't new. This isn't something that somebody's just invented. But we have now got kids with so many gaps in learning. We have got kids who are practically nocturnal because the lockdown has skewed the social skills. It skewed the way they see lives. Education has never been more important. And look at the way in which we're treating our teachers. We should be revered. There should be a, a virtual sedan chair picking them up and taking them to work in the morning. And what we've now got is we've got this body of professionals who are looking for a way out when we need them in the classrooms. And we need them in the classrooms doing the job they've been paid to do, not the 90% of the proof that somebody needs to see to make sure they're doing what they're doing. It's nonsense. Yeah, so my Facebook group, in many respects, takes those individuals and shows them methods of leaving the classroom and one of them is tutoring one of them is tutoring but what's important is tutoring takes time to build up it's not something you can just leave overnight and suddenly step into 30 hours a week it takes time to build and skill and get yourself sorted but as a as a means of the best of both worlds i think it's brilliant you meet a tutor these days, Ludo, and the one thing they'll say is, I wish I'd done this 20 years ago. Because it's a great job. It mm -hmm. really, really is one of the best things you can be doing. You've got the privilege of sitting with a kid on a one-to-one. -one. You've got the privilege of sitting with a kid on a one-to-three. You can work magic with that child. I always say it's like going to the doctors. If the doctor's receptionist went next and 30 people walked into the doctor's surgery, you'd have precious little chance of getting that one diagnosis that you needed. But you scale those numbers down. And particularly now that I can bang the drum like this and say that actually it's not the privileged. It's not the privileged that can just afford this because tutoring has scaled down and has become more and more affordable. Any decent tutor can get themselves Ofsted registered and play childcare vouchers and all sorts. There are ways in which we can reach the communities now. And if you can't afford the tutoring, then your school can be providing it for your child through the National Tutoring Programme. So yep. we've been able to make massive, massive leaps here within this profession. And it is something that I'm proud to be a member of. I really, I love it. And I love empowering tutors and empowering teachers through this medium, which I think gives us the real best of both worlds. And that's what you've done today, Sharon. That's what you've you, you've sat there and you have empowered a whole new group of, of listeners here, whether they're tutors or not, whether they're teachers, whether they're parents who are also at the forefront of improving um, the lives of, of, of tutors, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you have, have, have taken your experience and, and, and you've given a real boost to those tutors. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for the tireless, the, the work that you do with uh, Life After Teaching. I know that that supports you know, th literally thousands of... We have got plans for that, Ludo. We've got yeah. plans to really turn that into a CIC, to start to bring in support mechanisms that are needed. We're growing it. At this moment in time, we are allowing organic growth. But the vision behind the Life After Teaching is that we start to work with groups of life coaches, business coaches, counsellors, legal teams so that we become a platform that teachers can actually turn to as a real organically grown alternative i've also got some, i've also got some acts to grind myself personally i think we need to look at the exit strategies of ndas with teachers that gag them and put them into a position where they think they can only leave a classroom through a certain route i also think it's absolutely ludicrous that a teacher can only resign three times a year that needs sorting out for a start. What other profession means you've only got three points of exit throughout the year? So there's a lot we can do to start to bring about change within the profession, but there's nothing better than doing it organically in a social media group that's got the right tone. We don't offload. We don't kick off on that group. I won't allow it. Everything is done supportive 
and lifting each other up. And I'm also using it as a platform to try and meet Greg Davis because I've been secretly married to him in my own head for the last five years. So I'd actually quite like that to happen in reality. So the more I keep promoting this, hopefully I'll get that big white frock. All right, no pressure Ludo, but if you've got any connections, that would be most appreciated. Okay. That's the metric by which we'll measure whether this, this episode was a success. Whether or not I become Mrs. Sharon Davis. Okay, well, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Let's make that the reality. Okay, well, Sharon, okay. thank you so very, very much for that. And I'm sure that, um, you know, in the coming weeks and months, the education sector will change as it has done so much. And there will be new updates and, and, and new place, places to meet and new skills to learn. And, and you can do that within the Life After Teaching group. So go and join that. That'll be in the show notes below. Uh, if you are a tutor and you're looking for work, uh, you can uh, reach out to Connexus Tuition, uh, of which Sharon is, is the founder and, 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 and the forerunner and the head and the leader and the, and the chief and anything, any title that you need to, that, 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 that denotes leadership. Um, she will also, of course, be speaking at the Love Tutoring Festival um, at the end of this month, the end of June, uh, as part of the NTP Partners and Schools Roundtable on Thursday, the 1st of July. So you can catch Sharon uh, as part of that there as well. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we wish you a very, very good day. And, uh, and we'd love to have you back on whenever. Thank you kindly. Thanks, Ludo. Okay, cheerio then, Sharon. Bye.